All right, little, little post-lunch. I'm just gonna try not to put everybody to sleep. It's a pretty low bar, we'll see if we can hit it. Um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of different things today as it relates to like the, the handoffs that happen in the revenue engine, specifically within sales and, and customer success. But want you to know right now, I'm gonna, it's gonna seem like I'm taking credit for a lot of smart things that a lot of smart people did. And so I wanna make sure that you kinda have a chance to, to look at the A team and understand that there are brilliant, very hardworking people behind this. I'm just the lucky one who gets to, gets to talk about it. Um, just, like, just like at Divi, I feel like I have an A team. Um, probably wouldn't do you much good to hear me talk without understanding my, my team at home. Um, you can tell that it's an A-team one because she's very cute. Um, she's four months old yesterday. And the wife, you can tell she's A-plus because that little knee bend that makes me look taller than I actually am. And uh, she kind of yeah, sneak, sneaks that in there. Um, super quick bio, like who I am. Um, I grew up in a really small town in northern Nevada. It's called Winnemucca. But we got some, well, oh, yeah, that's you. You love Winnemucca? We got a chat. Um, there's like eight people who live in Winnemucca. Um, so uh, my dad, he started physical therapy clinics and, and was kind of an entrepreneur. I always figured I'd go to work for him. Anyway, when I turned 14, he's like, you can't work for me until you work for somebody else. So I went and, and got a job bussing tables with this, this lady who's in this photo here. Her name's Ashley Ferguson. Um, she was phenomenal. She was an entrepreneur. She had MS. She was absolutely like the, the toughest person I ever met. Also like a pretty tough boss. Taught me a lot of things. Um, and one, one of the job responsibilities I ended up having there was like the hiring and firing and scheduling, stuff like that. And in our slow times, we have to like reduce hours and reduce shifts, stuff like that. And I hated it, right? Because people, people needed to work. And so without really knowing what I was doing, I was 16, I started like generating demand to basically bring people in during our slow periods. And you know, we, we had some success with that. We were able to s smooth out our seasonality and it was great. And I was like, hey, this is a lot more fun than, uh, than, than managing the restaurants. And so I started the, the second thing there, which is you know, SMS marketing, where we worked with all these different small businesses to, to help them grow. It was super rewarding, it kind of like, it kind of, um, ignited this lifelong passion for me of helping middle America businesses. Anyway, um, I got it in my head that venture-backed startups were the major leagues, and so I, I joined a, a company here in Utah called Jive, and was with them from zero to you know, 85 million in ARR, and, and we got bought by the GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar team out of Boston. And uh, right about then, uh, Blake Murray, the co-founder of Divi reached out, we got connected, and Divi hadn't raised a dollar, it was just kind of an idea, and I fell in love with it because it helped the same small, small and medium businesses that, that I love, and it was just a brilliant idea. Um, it was, the, the genesis was like, can we connect credit card, corporate credit cards to spend management and expense management software? That was the, the original idea. Anyway, joined up with Divi, and over the next four years, we grew from zero dollars in revenue to over 300 million, and we, we sold the business about a year ago to Bill.com for two and a half billion dollars, which is where, where I currently am um, today. So that's like kind of the, the bio. I learned, mostly starting at Jive, how much time the different disciplines of revenue spend fighting each other. It was, it was bizarre to me. I, I, I kid you not, we would have you know, meetings upon meetings just to agree on like, whose data set we were using, right? And, and who had the source of truth and you know, everybody kind of had their, their own unique perspective. But I started to really think, wow, if we could just reduce the internal friction between these different disciplines, between you know, sales and, and onboarding and customer success, we could go and fight the market instead of fighting each other, and golly, like, wouldn't that be fun? Um, and so I, I started to talk about this in terms of swing. 
And I don't know, we had some Winnemucca people in here, so maybe we'll keep getting some shockers, but you know, maybe some crew folks. In crew, swing is when every oar is hitting the water at the same time with the same amount of force going in the same direction. And how do we get swing between all of our teams? That's the analogy that we started using. And, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have you watch this video because, because it's amazing and it'll, it'll help you understand a little bit more about what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes. I think people knew that we weren't expected to win, especially in the Varsity 8, and so it was kind of just like, well, we have literally nothing to lose. We can go out there and like we can do whatever we want. Now it's time to go to the Division 1 1-8 Grand Final. So I was like, like I, I took a deep breath and was just like, I want to enjoy this race. It's my last, ra last race with a W on my chest. All of these crews very tightly packed. Not very much of a separation at this point. We lost to Cal three times. We lost to Stanford once. Like we were not undefeated. And I think within all that, we still were talking about it. We're like, yeah, I think we can win. Yeah, like. I think we can win this. So it is now Michigan's in the lead. Texas is moving. Ohio State, Cal, Stanford. Very, very close for that third position. Washington now is in sixth. No one, no one plans to be in dead last at the halfway mark. And then no, especially no one plans to go from dead last to first. Like, that just doesn't happen. We're at 38. We're coming into the last 500. And guess what? We got speed up our sleeve. No! No! Here comes Washington now moving through Cal. We've got less than 500 meters. Margins are getting tight. It was just so loud. Marley was screaming. I could hear the Texas coxswain screaming and I could hear the crowd screaming, and at that point, I was like, oh my god. Stay with me! Two down! Are you ready? We gotta go! Sit up! Texas by a foot! Here comes the Huskies! The dogs are moving! Last 250, Jen! And your career with the national championship! I love the, the swing analogy as it relates to our teams. There's a few things that I want to point out. Do you notice at the beginning of the video when they're practicing on the rowing machine? Perfect unison, right? Practicing. Then you get out on the water. How do you perform? How do you practice? And in a boat like that, they, they make those things super light. One person hits the water at the wrong time, you're not like going to lose a race. You're going to flip over. And I think about that a lot with our businesses and the amount of time that we spend trying to make sure that we are in swing as it relates to revenue generating customer facing teams. This is the quote on swing, right? All eight crew members rowing in such perfect unison that no single action by any one is out of sync with those of the others. The faster you're trying to go with, with your business, the more important this becomes. To, to actually like have swing. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how do you actually do that. Um, this is uh, something that you're not gonna be able to read super well, but this is an example 
of one of my scorecards to, to our CEO early on, early on at Divi. And I'm talking about every stage of the funnel because it doesn't really matter if sales is crushing it, but customer success is having big problems. The inverse is true as well. It's how every single or is hitting the water that actually determines like the, the success. So, you know, a, a sales problem in a lot of ways is a customer success problem. A customer success problem is a sales problem, right? They're, they're the same things. So we got in the habit very early on to create swing about talking about them all together. The good, the bad, and the ugly on a weekly basis in like our scorecard format. We started to get feedback about what this swing was looking like on, on an individual level. People in sales were like, wow, I've never, you know, I've never worked at a place where you know, marketing cared about my number as much as I did. Customer success folks were too. I've never seen salespeople care as much about our NRR and our NDR and you know, everything else that, that they, they care about. They care about it because we're looking at the whole funnel all of the time as, as one team that's trying to get into swing. So there's a couple of key principles here. You have to have the right structure. You have to make sure that everybody knows what their, what their job is. Like, and, and to me, I, I, we, call that, we call that quotas. We try to boil down the job into very clear numbers. Third is making sure that you're actually measuring and, and compensating the right types of things. And that means push it one step deeper in the funnel. Just like with boating, if, if, I'm, if I'm the fastest oar in that boat, but it's not hitting at the same time as, as everybody else, it's worthless. So you have to make sure that you're compressing and measuring one step deeper in the funnel. And then this fourth one sounds super easy, actually gets fairly complicated. Make sure everybody understands what the North Star is, right? For that University of Washington crew team, North Star is pretty clear. Cross the finish line before the other schools. How does that work in your business? And does your CSM know what the North Star is? Because it better be the same as what, the, what, what sales North Star is. Better be the same as what marketing's North Star is. They all better be the same thing. Otherwise, those oars are not hitting the water at the same time, right? So how do you start to envelop this, this one team kind of mentality? Making sure that everybody feels bought in and aligned to the success of everybody else, right? This is how we did it at Divi. We, we aligned all of these things with a, with a revenue function. That was a big thing for us. This is kind of what that ended up looking like. We clearly defined who was on first base for which things, right? So marketing, primary responsibility, demand for inbound sales, support for our mature cohorts in, in life cycle marketing, additional add-on products, all that kind of stuff. Like started to segment this very granularly in terms of who was responsible for what. And it, it had a lot of very positive side effects for us. Moving on to number two, measuring one step deeper in the funnel. So the ones that, that are really worth paying attention to for this group are, what is sales actually compensated on? right? Are you actually incentivizing sort of a, a, a churn and burn mentality? Or are you actually incentivizing a sale that, that's going to be successful based on how, how successful the customer is? So Divi's an interesting business. For those of you who don't know, um, we're 100% free. We make money on the usage. So when you use our credit card, we, we make money. That's the only way we make money. So usage forced us into a lot of very good habits. Sales couldn't sell a bad deal, get somebody to sign a contract, and then you know, you're fighting to not let them churn for the next 12 months. We had to have a, a, a sales process that aligned with the customer and that centered around usage. And if a customer was using Divi, they were very likely getting value. You can't really make, you can make somebody sign something from time to time. You know, you can sell a little bit of a, a hope and a prayer and, and get somebody to sign something. You can't really get somebody to use something. And so our, our, the way that we compensated our sales team was not only around the new business that they brought in, but what was their usage? 
when they came in the door? And did they get up and did they start getting value clearly? And what were our margins on, on those deals? And then we did the same thing for customer success. Like we cared about not only, not only the retention, not only the NRR, but we cared um, about the actual revenue that was coming from those things. And we started to care about margins and, and just different things that typically sit a little bit deeper in the funnel than, than in, in most organizations. We kept track of that stuff like religiously. Everybody's goals, this was very early on, you know, before we you know, raised a bunch of money and stuff, but we started to make sure that we met as a group and we always understood what was your goal, where are you at, and how confident are you that you're going to be able to reach your goal. And there were many, many times when during this meeting, you know, sales was feeling pretty confident. So they ended up spending a lot of time brainstorming and helping out with whatever customer success was focused on and fighting at the time. But everybody knowing everybody else's goals and making sure that they're measured one layer deep creates a lot of very, very positive alignment for everybody. We've gotten more sophisticated, obviously, um, throughout throughout the, the last couple of years, but it's the same principle these are, these are like our Tableau dashboards that everybody in revenue can see. So this is a, a customer success dashboard. What this does is it measures a score of our inputs. What are the things that we care about tracking that, that lead to success? So this is you know, um, quarterly business reviews. This is on sites. This is you know, the, the different amounts of check-ins, the different amounts of like new product updates that you're doing. We have that as our, our power score. That means, are you engaging in the right activities? And then we have what, what we measure as like our, our North Star, which is this NRR number um, on, on the other axis here. And if you're in the top right, it means you're doing the right activities and getting the right results. If you're top left, it means that you're getting the right results, but you're not doing the right activities, so your success might not be as durable, right? And then if you are bottom right, it means you're doing the, the work the way that we want you to, but you're not seeing the results. So at any time, I can pop in, any other leader can pop in and say, hey, we're, we need to train this person better because they're actually putting in the work, they're just not seeing the results. That's a management issue. Or hey, this person's not putting in, not putting in the work, not getting the results, we have to you know, figure that out. But this, this principle, which is overarching of, make this visible to everybody. This is a very important, thing for us as a revenue team, making sure that we all know what each other's priorities are and can step in and and be supportive. This is a Charlie Munger quote about incentives, right? And I've learned over the years, so often when I go in and there's, there's a problem, if I just sit down for a second and think, okay, what are we incentivizing people to do? It's like, oh, well, there's the problem. Like, I'm the idiot who set up the, the, the plan or the goal or, or you know, I'm, I'm rewarding X, Y, or Z behavior. Understanding how, impa- how impactful these incentives are is, is a huge deal. So what do you care most about? And you will start to see that get better and better over time, right? But it's, it's imperative that everybody owns an expectation, that it's not nebulous, that it's not you know, fuzzy, that, that you couldn't like go to a sales rep and say, well, hey, tell me what, tell me what our CSMs do, and for them not to have a clear answer, and, and you know, vice versa. Big deal um, in, in how you set that up. These are kind of some snapshots of, of how we set up those, those types of incentives. These are like our comp plans. Everyone from marketing all the way through to customer success is on a variable comp plan, and they measure about half, half in terms of what their primary function is. So for sales, a lot of that's, the half is new business. The other half is, well, how long do they stick around? And how much usage do we get out of them? And what do they do over time? Because what does that do? That allows sales to understand that they have to set the customer up for long-term success means you can't overpromise. It means you can't be, be fuzzy or, or you know, get somebody to, to commit to something that they don't actually want to do. You have to align very well with the customer, which aligns very well with what your long-term CSM is going to do at, at Divi. And these are the ways that we try to align a couple of different 
key functions. First one is we want to do what's right for the rep, we want to do what's right for the customer, and we want to do what's right for the business. And so when we think about these plans, we have to check all of those boxes every single time. And you know, sometimes, sometimes they, they, tend to, they tend to get stale or whatever, but we look at them and we answer those three questions. Better for the customer, better for the rep, better for the business. If so, then we kind of proceed with, with how we're incentivizing and how we're doing comp plans and, and how we measure quotas and success and, and all that good stuff. North Star. Um, again, this is, it's a fascinating thing because in all of your heads as, as leaders, it's pretty clear. You can prioritize, you can say, well, this is more important than that, and it, it kind of drives a lot of the way that you spend your time and how you make decisions. But one thing we noticed is a lot of times our, our leaders knew it, but not everybody else knew it. Not everybody, in, not everybody in customer success or in sales or in support could actually answer that question. And so we had to reiterate it over and over and over again. And so for us, it was usage. That was our North Star. It correlated to how we made money, of course, but it also correlated to the value that we were actually giving to a customer. So every single person in the entire company, whether you were an engineer or whether you were a support uh, whether you were a support rep, you knew that usage was our North Star. And that could help you make decisions and that could help you prioritize the same way that, that I would. Does it get more usage? Does it help our customer with usage? And, and you know, you could stack rank the different things that they were in your head. It's different for every business. Sometimes it's revenue, sometimes it's free cash flow, you know, whatever the case is. But making sure that you know what that North Star is and aligning everybody to it is a big deal. We also showed this dashboard every single company meeting for many, many years. So we always knew where we were at, we always knew where we were tracking, and why is an engineer working on a new product? Well, it's to drive more towards the North Star. Why are we you know, hiring for sales? Well, you know, to drive towards the North Star. You could understand everything about our business by aligning to the North Star, right? So to kind of to recap this, create the right structure. Make sure that it feels like there's one owner and that, you know, I, I tell people a lot, we don't have a customer success team. We don't have a sales team. We have a revenue team. And then we have people who focus on customer success and people who focus on, on sales as a part of that. Make sure that everybody carries their quota and understands their number, knows what is expected of them because winning and losing has to be very clear, both to you as a leader and to the rep because winning is contagious and so is losing. So define it well and make sure that you can generate positive momentum. Third thing, make sure that you're measuring and compensating things one step deeper because what does that do? That makes you care about the handoff. If I'm in sales and half of my incentive is around what happens to the customer once they get to my CSM, well, guess what I care about all of a sudden? I'm aligned, okay? Uh, and, then, and then the fourth one that we just talked about is make this North Star crystal clear and incredibly visible. Talk about it until you wanna throw up. That's, that's about how, when you know you've done it right. There's a couple of interesting like consequences to this that, that I found. The first is that you start to attract real A players because you're measuring what matters and there's not a whole lot of room for fluff. There's not a lot of room for somebody who's sure they sell a lot of deals, but they don't actually turn into any revenue because they just churn super fast, right? Like there's not a lot of room for fluff. So A players are drawn to that um, and, and people who aren't tend to go, go looking for another opportunity you really get people pumped up with a common goal. Freaking love that swing video. I have no idea what that coxswain was saying about half the time, but like she was pumped, right? And everyone having a common goal is something that you can charge at very, very hard. Third thing is you get to see and fix mistakes very quickly because there's no, there's no disputes around you know, the, the, the data or the problems. Like you understand things very fast and you're able to react to them very quickly. If you have a churn problem, it shows up fast. If you have an implementation problem, it shows up fast and you can like dive in and actually start to get in problem solving mode without all the bicker back and forth, finger pointing blame game that, that happens a, a lot of the time. And then the last thing is you grow faster and you out execute the, and you out execute people. Um, I, I think about the, the crew analogy. 
getting in better swing, that's the key. Whoever had the, the best individual crew member, the best individual rower, they didn't win the national championship that year. The team won it. And so thinking about, thinking about ourselves as, as that team in that revenue funnel, it ends up, it ends up putting a lot of uh, executional excellence into you in, in very interesting ways. And if you don't laugh at this slide, you don't have a sense of humor. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And I, I think we have three minutes left. If anyone has any questions, happy to, happy to answer them. Thanks. Um, so when you talk about the revenue team as this holistic team, I'm wondering how you facilitated that with ICs on the team. Like, did they see themselves as part of this revenue team? Um, it's hard enough in a large CS team to get everyone feeling like one. Yeah, 100%. They all felt like part of the revenue team. Like obviously like I sit in sales or I sit in customer success, but they felt like one team because we were chasing one goal. It was like a relay race where you just had a different leg of the race and the baton got handed to you at a different time, but it was the same race, the same North Star, and they all very much felt like part of a revenue team. Um, so in each of those companies, you had like pretty massive scaled ramp ups. And so I'm curious how you managed budget dynamics between all of those teams with that North Star out there. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, budgeting's, budgeting's always a lot easier when you understand what you're prioritizing against, right? So when you sit down, you know, at the beginning of the year and you have you know, let's, let's say a growth target, let's say that's your priority, then you get to look at all the different stages of your funnel. So for us, you know, I think, you know, back, back in historical Divi, our NRR was something like 170%. We invested a lot into customer success. And the more usage we could drive, the better our business was. And so we'd look and we'd say, okay, when they get to customer success, this is what revenue and usage we can generate. In sales, in marketing, this is like how much it costs. And you obviously have to do a, a bit of everything, but how, how it made budgeting a little bit easier is we could clearly understand what a dollar spent here versus a dollar spent there got us. And that was kind of the, the guiding philosophy for, for how we would budget across everything. Right. And I think that brings us to time. Yeah, everybody, very warm welcome and thank you.